Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Professor Vageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are doing a course on Bharatiya Nyay Sahita 2023, the Substantive Criminal Law. Today, we will be dealing with lesson number 12, which is Offenses Affecting Life. So students, to begin with, we will try and understand two very significant concepts in criminal law and that is of culpable homicide and murder. So first, what is culpable homicide? See, culpable homicide is a term that constitutes two terms, culpable and homicide. Culpable means something which is criminal and homicide means Killing of a human being by another human being. See, if a human being kills an animal, that would not amount to culpable homicide because what has been killed is not a human being. Similarly, if a human being is mauled by a tiger, that would again not constitute culpable homicide because it is not homicide. For homicide, there has to be killing of one human being by another human being. And then when homicide is qualified by the term culpable, what that implies is that the homicide should be criminal. Now that raises a question, is it possible that a homicide might not be criminal? So can we say that a killing of a human being by another human being, and is that not a crime? Yes, there is a possibility. We have exceptions given under our Bharatiya Nyay Sahita earlier, which was the Indian Penal Code, in which there are certain circumstances wherein the accused might be either exempted from criminal liability because he either has some kind of a reasonable excuse or a reasonable justification, such as we talk about mistake of fact, we talk about the defense of necessity or private defense. So those are the cases when a homicide is not culpable. So we will try to understand when does a homicide become culpable in nature so as to attract punishment under the law. And when does that culpable homicide amount to murder? See, it is not every culpable homicide that amounts to murder. Murder is the highest degree of culpable homicide. So unless and until an act is culpable homicide, it cannot be murder. So it is not wrong to say that culpable homicide is the genus and murder is the species. So it is only culpable homicides of a very high degree that qualify to be murders for which there is the extreme penalty provided under the law. So what are those culpable homicides that amount to murders and what are those culpable homicides that do not amount to murders? So that is something which we will be discussing in this lesson. So first of all, let us try to understand under law what amounts to culpable homicide. So for that, what does the law say? Whoever causes death. So the first essential ingredient is death and death of a human being because that is a homicide. So first ingredient is there should be death of a human being by doing an act. Okay. So what is required is that the act of accused should be the causal factor of death. See the act could be poisoning, striking, burning. Sometimes when you are under a legal obligation to act in a particular manner and you don't do that act. So that is what is an unlawful omission under the law. So suppose you are a nurse who is being entrusted with the responsibility to take care of a person who is critically ill and when you 
omit to do your responsibility. So that is an act of yours which is the causal factor of death of that person. So here act could be an illegal act that is when you do something that you were not supposed to do. It could be an illegal omission also that is when you do something, when you do not do something that you were legally supposed to do under the law. So what is required after death of a human being in order to constitute culpable homicide is second act of accused to be causal factor of death. It should be the principal reason behind the death should be the causal factor of death. Now we will for the purposes of understanding section 100 we will hypothetically divide section 100 in three constituent parts. Now why that is required is in order to understand the gravity of culpable homicide because later on you will understand when we will move on from culpable homicide to murder that why this kind of a hypothetical distinction is important. So whoever causes death by doing an act with the intention of causing death first this would be 299-1 intention of causing death. Second would be intention of causing bodily such bodily injury as is likely to cause death and then third would be with the knowledge that he is likely by such act to cause death commits the offense of culpable homicide. So in order to constitute culpable homicides there must be death of a human being, death to be the resultant uh, of the act which was done by the accused and now the third and the most important ingredient is what was the degree of mens rea by which the act which resulted in death was done. If the act was done with the intention of causing death, so intention is the highest degree. Whenever there is intention, it can never exist irrespective of knowledge. So intention consists of knowledge also. So intention is a purposeful act, a designed act with the uh, expectation that the action will necessarily translate into the forbidden consequences. So that would be the highest degree of mens rea when it is covered under clause 299 or clause 100, clause 1, 299 was the earlier provision when we had IPC. So in IPC section 100 of the new BNS was covered under section 299 of the old Indian Pedal Code. So first would be with the intention of causing death or second when the act of the accused which results in death of the deceased person was done with the intention of causing such bodily injury as is likely to cause death. See now intention to cause death is different from intention of inflicting a bodily injury that is likely to cause death. But then how do we interpret clause 2 of section 100? For this, this is a clause which is not to be read as a whole but we have to divide it further into two hypothetical parts. First is intention of inflicting bodily injury, such bodily injury. That is the bodily injury which you inflicted must be the same injury that you intended to inflict. That is it should not be an accidental injury. That is see if you aim at a particular body part, you use a weapon and you aim it at a particular body part and then you use it with a particular force so as to inflict the kind of injury that you had in mind. So that is the intended injury if it results in that particular injury. But suppose you stumble and fall and your weapon hits some other body part that you did not have in your contemplation, then that would be an accidental injury, that would not be an intended injury. So here before 299 what is required is that with the intention of causing such bodily injury and second is as is likely to cause death. So as is likely to cause death, now who determines whether the injury was likely to cause death or not? Now that is for objective determination that is something which the doctors will testify to. Whoever conducts the autopsy will testify what was the nature of the injury. Was it an injury that was likely to cause death or not? So if it is an injury which was likely to cause death then the case would be covered under 299 not otherwise. So for 299 two, two parts 
one the injury should be an intended injury and second the injury should be such as the doctors testify to be an injury that is likely to cause death okay and then coming to the third clause when what amounts to culpable homicide when the act which results in death of the deceased person was done with the knowledge see here we are not talking about intention to cause death we are not requiring intention to inflict a bodily injury that is likely to cause death knowledge is something which can exist irrespective of intention also moreover what happens in prosecution since the responsibility is totally on the prosecuting side sometimes it becomes very difficult to establish intention on part of the accused person then in such cases if the person was a person of sound mind and if the person has done an act we cannot allow such a person to take the plea, plea that i was not aware of the natural reasonable or probable consequences of my actions because every sane person is presumed to know the natural and probable consequences of his or her actions so that is a presumption that operates in such cases so that is why we have clause 3 in section 100 which talks about knowledge so even if we are not able to establish intention even if we are not able to establish intention to inflict a bodily injury as was likely to cause death but if we can prove that see this person has done this act deliberately and the knowledge was there again something which we can presume unless and until the accused can take the plea that he was suffering from unsoundness of mind or maybe was under the influence of some uh, intoxicating substance so as to rob him of his capacity to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong or what he is doing so as to be able to comprehend the consequences of his or her actions then in such cases maybe we could consider otherwise but if a person has voluntarily consciously done an act even if we are not able to establish intention but a minimum degree of knowledge is something which we can safely attribute to the accused person and then it would not be wrong to convict the accused with the help of 2993 that is even if we are not able to establish intention so if the case of the accused falls under any of the three categories of section 100 it is a case of culpable homicide okay now whether it amounts to murder or not that is something which we will talk about when we discuss the offense of murder but for now what is needed i hope you are clear with these concepts that is what amounts to culpable homicide again something very important that it is only an act that amounts to culpable homicide that can amount to murder so murder is not something which just comes out of the blue and it is not culpable homicide and it is suddenly just murder no first it has to be a culpable homicide and only then depending upon the gravity degree of culpable homicide will be decide whether it is a case of murder or whether it is a case of culpable homicide not amounting to murder so many times the distinction that students ask for ki what is the difference between culpable homicide and murder basically they are one and the same thing it is just a higher degree of culpable homicides that amounts to murders so there are certain illustrations appended to section 100 in order to further clarify what amounts to culpable homicide see illustration a what it says a lays sticks and turf over a pit see students here we are not going into the question whether the pit was dug by a whether it was dug up by someone else or anything like that let us just concentrate on the facts that are before us because in criminal law it is very very important to look and carefully evaluate the facts on record that is the facts that have been given to you because it is on the basis of those facts which have been established that we apply the law and eventually re reach to a legal conclusion so what does the illustration say a lay sticks and turf over a pit with the intention of thereby causing death see again the illustration doesn't say whose death he intended to cause the illustration merely says this thing that there was a pit it was covered by sticks and turf by a and while doing that act what was the intention of a to cause death or with the knowledge that death is likely to be thereby caused okay even if we cannot establish that he intended to cause death but when he was covering a pit with sticks and turf he must have known that see if it is a superficial cover anyone will fall in it and there is a possibility of the person dying so knowledge can safely be attributed to such a person now further let us see z believing the ground to be firm treads on it 
falls in and is killed. So here A has committed culpable homicide. Now whether A's act of culpable homicide amounts to murder or not, that is something which we will understand when we discuss section 101. As of now, see because A has done an act with the intention of causing death or with the knowledge that death will result from it and it has actually resulted in death. So if we come to section 100, what does it say? Death of a human being. Yes, in this illustration, Z has died. Act of accused to be causal factor of death. Second condition of 100 and that is here. Act of A is the causal factor of death of Z. And now the third thing. Was the act done with the intention of causing death or with the intention of inflicting a bodily injury likely to cause death or with the knowledge that the act will result in death? See, because that is also being satisfied. It could be either intention, it could be knowledge. So, we can safely say here that A is guilty of culpable homicide. Now, moving to illustration B. It says, A knows Z to be behind a bush. So, you see A has the knowledge that Z is sitting behind a bush, whether he is hiding or whatever. But B does not know it. Okay, So, there is this that Z is hiding behind a bush. This fact is known to A, but this fact is not known to B. Then, A intending to cause or knowing it to be likely to cause Z's death induces B to fire at the bush. B fires and kills Z. Here B may be guilty of no offence, but A has committed the offence of culpable homicide. Now here, why is B not guilty of any offence? Because B was not aware of the presence of a human being behind the bush. And B was asked by A to fire at the bush. Now till the time we cannot attribute any kind of an intention to cause death or intention to inflict a bodily injury likely to cause death or knowledge that the act will result in death. Till the time we cannot attribute any one of these three to B, B cannot be held for the guilty for the offence of culpable homicide. But here A can be. Actually A has not fired the shot but he has made B fire a shot which has resulted in death and this was done while A had the knowledge that this is something which will result in death. So here A is guilty of culpable homicide but although it is A B's act which has resulted in death but still B would not be guilty of culpable homicide. Why? Because although the act was there, death was there, but the one of the three ingredients of section 100 that are required, intention or knowledge that was not there. So here we would not be guilty of culpable homicide. Then illustration C. A by shooting at a foal with intent to kill and steal it. So here A has the intention to kill that animal and also to steal it. But what A ends up doing is, he kills B who is behind a bush. A not knowing that he was there. Here A was not aware of the presence of B behind a bush. He wanted to kill an animal and steal that animal and that is the intention which he had while he shot at the bush believing that there was an animal behind the bush. Whereas actually there was B who was behind the bush and A not knowing that he was there. So, this thing was not known to A. Here, although A was doing an unlawful act, see killing and stealing an animal is also, also an unlawful act, but he was not guilty of culpable homicide as he did not intend to kill B or cause death by doing an act that he knew was likely to cause death. So, here you see what he has done, he had the intention to kill an animal. His act has resulted in killing of a human being. For culpable homicide, what is required is that intention and the act both must be in regards to a human being. So, the, what is required is there should be intention to cause death of a human being and the death of a human being should be caused. In illustration, see what has happened. Intention was to cause death of an animal but what has resulted is death of a human being. So, he could be guilty of any other offence but he would not be guilty of culpable homicide. So, students, there are certain explanations appended to section 100 to further bring in more clarity as to understand what amounts to culpable homicide. There is explanation 1 that reads, a person who causes bodily injury to another, who is laboring under a disorder, disease or bodily infirmity and thereby accelerates the death of that other shall be deemed to have caused his death. 
So this is a deeming provision which in a way creates a sort of presumption that is if it is your act that has resulted in death, although the person was already suffering from any kind of a disease or infirmity, but it was your reason that accelerated the death of that person, then you would be responsible for causing the death of such a person. Then explanation 2, it says where death is caused by bodily injury, the person who causes such bodily injury shall be deemed to have caused his death. Although by resorting to proper remedies and skillful treatment, the death might have been prevented. The logic behind explanation 2 is that unless and until you had given that kind of an injury, to the deceased person, the person would not have eventually died. That is irrespective of the fact that the person could not get proper medical attention and because he could not get medical attention, he died. Proper and adequate medical attention could have saved that person's life. But had it not been for the injury that was inflicted by you, the person would not have died irrespective of the fact whether medical attention was available or not. Because the law, it proceeds on the presumption that medical attention might not be readily available to every person at all times. So in such cases, despite the fact that the person could have been saved by resorting to a proper or skillful medical help, the fact that it is your injury, the injury that was given by you that has eventually caused the death of that person, so you would be held responsible irrespective of what other reasons could have been. But it's your injury, the injury that you give, gave and then there were some other supervening circumstances due to which that person died. The injury which was given by you would not have resulted in death had it not been for that supervening instance or supervening circumstances. Then in such cases it can be pleaded that you should not be held guilty for the death of such person. Then coming to explanation 3. It says the causing of death of a child in the mother's womb is not homicide. See, an unborn child is not to be covered in the definition of homicide because for homicide what we require is death of a human being by another human being. So till the time the child is in the mother's fetus, the causing the death of such a child would amount to feticide. It would amount to miscarriage but it would not amount to culpable homicide. But further what does the provision say? It may amount to culpable homicide to cause the death of a living child if any part of that child has been brought forth though the child may not have breathed or been completely born. So while the child was in the process of taking birth, if that time the child was alive and the child was in the process of taking birth and if at that time the child has been killed, then it is something which would be covered under culpable homicide. So after understanding culpable homicide, let us now proceed to understand what amounts to murder. So section 101 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita says, except in the cases here and after accepted. So here they are referring to the five exceptions that are appended to section 101. Earlier this was covered under section 300 of the Indian Penal Code. This was an old law which has recently been uh, scrapped by Bharatiya Nyay Sahita which would be implemented from July 1, 2024. So what does section 101 say? Except in the cases herein after accepted, culpable homicide is murder if the act by which death is caused is done with the intention of causing death. So now let us go back to 299 which said act of accused to be the causal factor of death okay. and the act by which death is caused is done with the intention of causing death. So that hypothetical clause 1 of section 100 is identical with clause A of section 101, intention of causing death. See the first part of section 100 and the first part of section 101, act by which death is caused. This is identical and then clause 1 of 100 and uh, clause A of 101. These are identical. Okay? This is with the intention of causing death. Then B, if the act by which death is caused is done 
with the intention of causing such bodily injury as the offender knows to be likely to cause the death of the person to whom the harm is caused. Now here we are talking about a specific mens rea. Like see if there is a person who is suffering from any kind of a disorder or disability and if you are aware of that particular medical condition of that person and to take advantage of that medical condition you deliberately give an injury which you know will cause the death of that person and the person dies because of that. So then the case would be covered under murder. But as we read in section 100 which was talking about if there is a person laboring under any kind of a disease or deformity or any kind of an injury disease and it is your act that results in death it would amount to culpable homicide. Now when read along with this provision clause B of 101 now it is further clear that see if you had the knowledge about that medical condition of the person and despite that you gave that kind of an injury then it is a case which would be covered under 101b otherwise the case would be covered under section 100. So if you did that act without the knowledge of the medical condition of the person still you would be held responsible but only for culpable homicide. But if you do that act which causes the death of the person with the intention or with the knowledge that the person is suffering from this kind of a disease or deformity or disability and that results in the death then the liability would be for a higher offense and which would be murder. Say for example you are aware that a person is suffering from hemophilia and you give a cut to that person a significant cut which leads in heavy blood loss due to which the person loses his life. Now had the person not been suffering from hemophilia maybe he could have been saved but you despite having knowledge of that particular medical condition of that person you gave an injury which resulted in the death of that person. Similarly if you are aware that there is a person who is suffering from a diseased spleen or maybe an enlarged liver. So what happens? A person who is suffering from that kind of a medical condition, even a blow of ordinary force, something which was playfully administered by one friend to him, can result in the death of that person. But here then again, what would be the determining factor? Were you aware of that medical condition? If you were not aware, liability would be lesser. But if you were aware of that medical condition and you still do that act, which causes the death of that person then the liability would be for murder as per section 101 clause B. Next is clause C to section 101. What it says if the act by which death is caused is done with the intention of causing bodily injury to any person and the bodily injury intended to be inflicted is sufficient in the ordinary course of nature to cause death. See students clause C of section 101 is quite similar to clause 2 of section 100. Okay. We just discussed it that if the act which causes the death was done with the intention of causing a bodily injury likely to cause death that would be covered under 100 clause 2. But if the act was done and the bodily injury intended to be inflicted is sufficient in the ordinary course of nature to cause death then the act would amount to murder. So what is the difference here? Intention to inflict bodily injury is the same. What is the determining factor is what was the nature of the injury? That is something for objective determination which the doctors will testify to that is what was the nature of the injury. Whether it was an injury that was likely to cause death or whether that was an injury that was sufficient to cause death in the ordinary course of nature. If the doctors say that injury is an intended injury, so if it can be proven that the injury was an intended injury, okay, that is something which can be established in the courts of law. So if it can be established that the injury was an intended injury then the second part is purely for objective determination which will be determined on the basis of nature of injury. If the doctor says that the injury was only just as was likely to cause death the case would be covered under culpable homicide whereas if the doctors testify that the injury was such as was sufficient to cause death in the ordinary course of nature then it would amount to murder. See what is the difference between these two clause? An injury is likely to cause 
cause death when there is still some bit of a possibility there is a high degree of probability that it may result in death but in exceptional cases maybe it would not have resulted in death also so that is an injury which is likely to cause death but then when we talk about an injury which is sufficient to cause death in the ordinary course of nature it means there is a very high degree of probability that in the ordinary course of nature nobody can ever survive that kind of an injury so if the injury was of such a degree and the person has eventually succumbed to it then it is a case which falls under clause c of section 101 which is murder there is a leading case on this it is virsa singh versus state of punjab now what had happened in this case this is virsa singh's case it's a leading judgment in which what had happened the accused he thrust a spear in the abdomen of the deceased with such force that a large amount of his abdomen was uh, punctured ruptured and three of his intestines also came out from which undigested food was also oozing out so it was a very very terrible injury because of which the uh, deceased he died eventually now this accused person he took the plea that see i did not have the intention of inflicting a bodily injury that was sufficient to cause death in the ordinary course of nature so what the judges observed in this case was that it is a fallacious argument that most of the time accused persons resort to in cases of this nature and that is they argue that although we had the intention to inflict this injury but we never had the intention to inflict an injury that was sufficient to cause death in the ordinary course of nature so now see this is a clause which is not to be read in one breath it is to be divided into two subparts and understood like the first part is the intended injury which is for subjective determination before the courts the courts will decide whether it was an intended injury or whether it was an accidental injury if it was an intended injury the second part is purely for objective determination what was the nature of the injury so if the doctor say that it is an injury likely to cause death it is culpable homicide if the doctor says it is an injury sufficient to cause death in the ordinary course of nature it is a case of murder and in virsa singh's case it was held that the kind of injury although it was a single blow it was a single spear thrust but with such force on such a uh, vital part of the body and that kind of an injury so it was an injury which was sufficient to cause death in the ordinary course of nature and the accused was held guilty of murder now coming to clause d which reads if the person committing the act by which death is caused knows that it is so imminently dangerous so students clause d of section 101 is similar to clause 3 of section 100 okay the only difference is in the degree of knowledge there the knowledge was such that it may result in death but here the knowledge is that it is so imminently dangerous that it must in all probability cause death or such bodily injury as is likely to cause death and commit such act without any excuse for incurring the risk of causing death or such injury as aforesaid so what is the difference between 100 clause 3 and 101 clause d the only difference is of a higher degree of knowledge see 100 which is culpable homicide is also demanding a degree of probability that it is an act which may result in death so that there is also a higher degree of probability but what 101 clause 2 is d is talking about is the highest degree of probability the act is so imminently dangerous that it must in all possibility lead to death so that is the high degree of knowledge that is required for 101 in addition to that knowledge what is required is that see the accused knows that he is doing a very very dangerous act and it will cause the death of a human being still that person does the act despite such a high degree of knowledge why did you do such a dangerous act that a person had to lose his life now do you have any excuse for incurring the risk so undertaken so here what is important is excuse here we are not talking about legal excuses see if the accused has any kind of a legal excuse such as a justification or any exemption that is applicable to his case then the case would be covered under general exceptions here we are talking about any reasonable excuse 
so if the accused has any excuse for incurring the risk then in such case it would be covered under 299 but if there is the absence of any excuse for incurring such a risk then the case would be covered under 101 clause d which is murder see there is a very famous case which is an old case dhirajia this case what had happened in that case there was a young woman a uh, child bride a 17 18 year old girl who was um, who had a little baby of 6 months now this girl she wanted to go and visit her parents but the husband he refused when she sought permission from her husband see this is a very old case a pre independence case now what had happened in that case the girl was very very keen to go and visit her parents but the husband was totally opposed to this idea so when she expressed her desire the husband instead of saying yes he rather threatened her that see no you are not going to leave the house so what happened she was keen to go so after so at night after the husband had gone off to sleep she picked up her late, little baby in her arms and she set out for her parents home now there was only one way that she was aware of and that was adjacent to the railway line there was a train that was crossing through their village and the line would straight away go to her parents village so this woman she set off on that way along with her baby in her arms when the husband woke up after some time he realized that the wife and the child were missing and he had every reason to doubt where they must have set out for so he also got up and he started to uh, follow them after some time the woman she heard certain footsteps following her in the distance she was scared that it might be her husband and when she turned around to see her fears came true because it was her husband who was following her from a distance she panicked and she started running when she started running the husband also started running now she was also carrying the baby in her arms so that is why she could not run as fast as her husband and as the distance started to close in between the two her panic grew and she was in a state of utter panic that in case he catches up with me he is going to beat me or something like that she, so she got scared and in that state of panic there was a well nearby she along with her baby she jumped into the well now by the time the husband reached there by the time he could get other help from other villagers till that time the baby had already died the woman could be rescued so when the woman was rescued she was put up on trial for killing her own child so now the question here is whether it is a case that could fall under culpable homicide or whether that would fall under murder see death of a human being yes the child has died act of accused to be the causal factor of death yes it is the act of the woman of jumping into the well along with her baby that has resulted in the death now the question to see whether it is culpable homicide or not is we have to see whether the act of the woman was done with the intention of killing her child no whether it was done with the intention of inflicting a bodily injury that was likely to cause death no now third whether it was done with the knowledge that it is an act which is likely to result in death see how can she deny knowledge if she had been a person of unsound mind then maybe we could have presumed that she was not aware but she was a person of sound mind and she was carrying the baby in her arms how can we accept that a mother would not be aware that exposing a little child to such a dangerous act would not result in the death of the child see so since her case was covered under third clause of section 100 at that time it was 299 the courts they further tried to examine whether it would also be covered under clause 4 of the old section 300 which is now section 101 so what it requires is whether the act was such as was likely to cause death and the imminent knowledge which the woman has of that imminently dangerous act did she do any act without any excuse for incurring the risk because see knowledge was already attributed to her so here also we can safely assume that if the person committing the act by which death is caused knows that it is so imminently dangerous that it must in all probability cause death or such bodily injury as is likely to cause death so that is something which is identical which we can apply in that case also but then the other factor that is required to convict a person for murder is that despite the knowledge of such a dangerous act being there the uh, person did the act the accused did the act but did the accused have any kind of an excuse for incurring the risk of death so here in this case did the woman have any excuse 
See, she was in a state of panic. We cannot say that it was a legal excuse. But nonetheless, did she have any excuse? And yes, the excuse was that she was in a state of utter panic due to which she could not properly comprehend the consequences of her actions due to which she jumped into the well along with her baby. In a state of panic, she forgot to keep the baby aside or maybe she just did not pay attention to this thing. So in such cases, it would be safe to say that the woman was convicted with the help of culpable homicide, not for murder. Why not for murder? Because despite having the high degree of knowledge, she at least had some sort of an excuse. We are not looking at legal excuses here. We are just talking about some sort of an excuse. There is a reasonableness behind the excuse. So if she had that kind of an excuse, she would be excused from criminal liability for murder. But nonetheless, conviction for culpable homicide would still be there. So students, now let us move on to illustrations appended to section 101, which further clarify cases which amount to murder. So illustration A, what it says, A shoots Z with the intention of killing him. Z dies in consequence, A commits murder. So here what has happened? Death of Z has been caused. Death has been caused by the act of A. The act of A was shooting at Z. So death of a human being, act done by A which has resulted in death and how was the act done? The act was done with the intention of killing Z and Z has died. So what is A liable for here for? Murder. This is a case which is covered under 100 part 1 and also 101 clause A. These are identical. So a case that is covered under section 100 first part is necessarily essentially in every case covered under section 101 clause A and the language is also identical that is with the intention of causing death. So this is a case which amounts to murder. Then illustration B. A knowing that Z is laboring under such a disease that a blow is likely to cause his death strikes him with the intention of causing bodily injury. Z dies in consequence of the blow. A is guilty of murder although the blow might not have been sufficient in the ordinary course of nature to cause the death of a person in a sound state of health. But if A not knowing that Z is laboring under any disease gives him such a blow as would not in the ordinary course of nature kill a person in a sound state of health. Here A, although he may intend to cause bodily injury, is not guilty of murder if he did not intend to cause death or such bodily injury as in the ordinary course of nature to cause death. So this is something which has been taken care of in section 101 clause. B. Now, illustration C. A intentionally gives Z a sword cut or club wound sufficient to cause death of a man in the ordinary course of nature. Z dies in consequence. Here A is guilty of murder although he may not have intended to cause death. Now why is A guilty of murder here? C. It says act was done by A. Act was done against Z. And the injury that was inflicted was intentionally inflicted. Now, what does the illustration say? What is the nature of injury? Injury is sufficient to cause death of man in ordinary course of nature. See, had the injury been just likely to cause death, then the case would have been covered under 100 clause 2. But since it is an injury which is sufficient to cause death in the ordinary course of nature, so it is something which would be covered under section 100. Clause C. Now, illustration D. A without any excuse. So here it is clearly saying that there is lack of any excuse, any legal excuse or reasonable excuse. It says A without any excuse fires a loaded cannon into a crowd of persons and kills one of them. A is guilty of murder although he may not have had a premeditated design to kill any particular individual. So this is a case which is covered under section 100 clause D. Why? Because the knowledge was there 
and despite having that knowledge, a person does such an eminently dangerous act. Now, does he have any excuse? The illustration clearly says without any excuse. See, firing a loaded gun into a crowd of persons, it is an eminently dangerous act. Someone or the other is going to die because of that. And still you do that? Do you have any excuse? If the answer is no, liability would only be for murder. Now, exceptions. There are five exceptions appended to section 101. So, if you would recall the language of section 101, what does it say? Except in the cases herein after accepted. So, what this means is, if the case of accused is covered under any one of these five exceptions, the case would amount to culpable homicide. But, if the case is not covered under any of the exceptions, because that is the language, what it says, except in the cases here and after accepted, culpable homicide would be murder. So, if the cases are covered under any of the five exceptions, it could be culpable homicide. But, if the case of murder is not covered under any of the five exceptions appended, then it would amount to murder. If the case is covered under exceptions, then what do we do? That although it is a case which is being covered under section 300, but in addition to being covered under any of the clauses of 300, it is also being covered under any of the exceptions. So, although the accused has committed murder, but he had certain reasons, any one of the reasons that are given under the five exceptions, if the case is covered under any of the five exceptions, then we reduce the liability from the highest degree of mens rea, we bring it down to the second highest degree of uh, murder, which would be culpable homicide not amounting to murder or culpable homicide of second degree. See, murder is the culpable homicide of highest degree, which we call as culpable homicide of first degree. But if it is a case that is covered under 300, that is culpable homicide of first degree plus also under any of the exceptions appended to this clause, then what happens? It would be again a case of culpable homicide not amounting to murder because then we would reduce the liability by 1 degree. So now there are 5 exceptions that are appended to section 101 earlier which was section 300. What are those exceptions? Exception 1. Exception 1 talks about grave and sudden provocation. So, the title of this exception is grave and sudden provocation. We will talk about this in detail now. It says culpable homicide is not murder. See, so again it would not amount to murder. If the offender while deprived of power of self-control by grave and sudden provocation. So, here we are talking about not any kind of provocation, we are talking about provocation which is grave. Grave, it should be so grave as to unsettle any person of ordinary sense or calmness. So, it should be so grave, so unsettling. See here we are not talking about hypersensitive persons, we are not talking about people who get angry at the drop of a hat, we are talking about reasonable persons and that is where we apply the test of a reasonable person. Whether any other person, reasonable person placed in the similar circumstances as the accused, see again whether it amounts to grave and sudden provocation, it is very very subjective for which we have to consider the education level the background of the accused, the kind of peer group that he has, the kind of temperament that a person has and then on the basis of it we have to decide whether that particular thing which provoked him was so grave as to unsettle that person. See for different people there might be a different level of tolerance. For some people there is a possibility that they might be used to usage of those cuss words or uh, some beatings or something like that but for another person any kind of snubbing given to that person might be very, very bad for a person who is not accustomed to that kind of crude way of living. So, what would depend is whether it was grave provocation or not. For that, we have to apply the subjective test of reasonable person and in that we have to see whether any other person placed in similar circumstances as the accused person would have given in to that provocation as being grave provocation or not. So, here what is required is that the offender while deprived of power of self-control by grave and sudden provocation. See the provocation should not only be grave, it should also be sudden. That is there should be no time to cool down. 
see while a person is deprived of his self control owing to that grave and sudden provocation that is when the person does not get the opportunity to develop the kind of mens rea required to commit the offence. But if the person gets a time to cool down, overcome that grave provocation, if the person gets an opportunity to plot and plan and carefully execute his plans, then we cannot say that the person has acted under the influence of that grave and sudden provocation because that is what is required for this exception to apply. Because see the language of the law, it is very clear. If the offender while deprived of self-control, so the crime should have been accused, uh, committed by the accused person while he was still deprived of his power of self-control. And why was the person deprived of his power of self-control? Because of the provocation which was so grave, which was so sudden that before he could regain his calm and composure, he ended up killing the other person. So, culpable homicide is not murder if the offender while deprived of power of self-control by grave and sudden provocation causes the death of the person who gave the provocation or causes the death of any other person by mistake or accident provided the provocation is not sought or voluntarily provoked by offender as an, as an excuse for killing or doing harm to any person. See, the provocation should not be self-sought. It should not be a staged managed situation in which I deliberately do something so that the other person acts in a manner in which I would get provoked and then take that as a pretext, pretext for killing that person. So, it should not be self-sought. Provocation should come to the accused person in order to make the accused person eligible for this defense. Second, it should not be given by anything done in obedience to the law or by a public servant in the lawful exercise of powers of such public servant. A public servant acting in lawful exercise of his powers and you take that lawful exercise of that public servant to be something which provokes you. Now the law is not going to give you any exemption on that ground. Third, if it is given by anything done in the lawful exercise of right of private defense. See, right of private defense is not available to an aggressor. So, if you are the aggressor and the other person does something in order to protect himself, he exercises the right of private defense. But just because the tables turn on you or because the person tries to defend himself, you take that as a pretext for killing that person and you are so provoked by that other person's act of lawful private defense, the law is not going to accept this kind of a defense on your part. Just because the tables were turned, it doesn't mean that now the other person is the aggressor and you get the right of private defense, no. So, what is required is that the provocation should be grave, it should be sudden and it should come to you. Explanation. Whether the provocation was grave and sudden enough to prevent the offence from amounting to murder is a question of fact. See, if the law says that the provocation was grave and so sudden that even though you have killed the person but you did it, why? Because you were provoked to such a rage and it was on account of some act of the deceased person. So now what happens? Your liability would be reduced by one degree. You would be still responsible for killing that individual but only for culpable homicide, not for culpable homicide amounting to murder. But in case you have killed that person without any grave and sudden provocation, then that would be culpable homicide amounting to murder. So here what does the explanation clarify? Whether the provocation was grave, whether it was sudden enough to prevent the offence from amounting to murder, it is a question of fact. Question of fact that is to be decided on the basis of the peculiar facts and circumstances of each and every case. Okay. So, depending upon case to case, it is for the courts to decide whether at act would amount to grave and sudden provocation in one particular case. It is not necessary that it would amount to a grave and sudden provocation in another case on similar facts. There could be some differences which the courts will look into by virtue of the peculiar facts and circumstances. So, students, in this lesson, we try to understand what amounts to culpable homicide, what amounts to murder and what is the first exception to murder that is grave and sudden provocation. Further, there are certain illustrations to grave and sudden provocation which we will be discussing in the next lesson. I hope you enjoyed listening to this lecture. Thank you. Thank you.